Hey, good evening. My name is Scott Hall. I am manager of the History and Genealogy Department. Today is Tuesday, December 8th, and the time is 6.35 p.m. Thank you all for joining us. This program is being presented as a partnership between the St. Louis County Library History and Genealogy Department and the Tri-State Genealogical Society in Evansville, Indiana. You will find a link to the Society's website in the chat. This evening's class is titled, Using German Newspapers When You Don't Know Much German, and I will be the presenter. This class will be recorded and made available on the St. Louis County Library website and on the library's YouTube channel. If you are viewing this Zoom webinar live, you are encouraged to type questions using the Zoom's uh, Q&A feature. I will answer questions at the end of the presentation. I've put the link to the class handout in the chat. We will now begin the class. Okay, so the title, as I said, is Using German Newspapers When You Don't Know Much German. My name is Scott Hall. I'm manager of the History and Genealogy Department here at St. Louis County Library. So um, just uh, want to uh, go over a little bit about what we're going to cover in this, in this presentation. I'm going to focus on German language newspapers, primarily German American uh, newspapers, um, ones that are published here in the United States but are in the German language. Uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit about finding German language newspapers, uh, locating death notices inside a German language newspaper, and deciphering death notices. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, notices that are related to death notices, but they are um, uh, a little bit different. Um, then I will uh, just talk briefly about uh, finding reports of death before uh, classified ads came into use. Um, and then a little bit about finding uh, more information in uh, newspaper articles. And then finally, I will address uh, the frock tour, which is the, uh, the type that uh, you will find most of these newspapers printed in, a little bit about the German alphabet and about vocabulary. So let's get started. So, Sie können kein Deutsch. So don't you know German? Um, so this is one of the challenges with working with German language newspapers. Of course, anything that's in the German language is, is oftentimes researchers don't know the language, but that shouldn't stop you or frighten you off from trying to use this source. Um, finding and deciphering death notices is very possible. Um, all you need to, is a little bit of knowledge and the right tools to uh, do it. So just a little background on the development of death notices in American newspapers. Uh, classified ads and death notices are considered classified ads because they are paid. Um, first appeared in American newspapers in the 18th century. By the mid 19th century, newspapers began publishing death notices for a fee. So how do you find a German newspaper for the community you're researching? So uh, first of all, I just want to mention what German newspapers we have here at St. Louis County Library. Um, we have a, a German daily newspaper that was called the Westliche Post. It was published between 1857 and 1938. And uh, we do have an online index to that newspaper. There's another daily newspaper called Anzeiger des Westens began publishing in 1842, and it was merged with Veslika Post in 1898. There is no index to that newspaper. And then we also have on microfilm Ostfriesische Nachrichten, uh, published between 1884 and 1969. Um, and we do have indexes in print for, um, for that uh, newspaper title. So that was a national newspaper. It was published for uh, the immigrant community, for Germans who came from East Friesland, uh, Friesland or Ost Friesland, um, uh, who settled primarily in the Midwest, but it was a national newspaper. And then we do have a few um, religious newspapers or church newspapers. Um, one is America, published between 1872 and 1914. Uh, and that was a Catholic newspaper published here in St. Louis. Um, 
So all of the newspapers that I list here so far are available, um, have been digitized on newspapers.com. So if you have a subscription to newspapers.com, you should be able to access these titles. I will mention one more, and that is Der Friedensbote, published between 1850 and 1934. And this was a newspaper published by the German Evangelical Synod of North America. Uh, that uh, denomination is now part of the Uni United Church of Christ. So there are some uh, bibliographies in print for newspapers. One is called American Newspapers 1821 to 1936. And the other one, uh, which is more specific to our subject, is German American Newspapers and Periodicals, 1732 to 1955. So both of these uh, publications, if you find the title um, that you're looking for, it will actually list the repositories that, that own that title or that have that title. Um, both of these uh, books are, are, are dated, uh, but usually that information will still be um, valid. Okay, another uh, place to look is the Library of Congress's online newspaper directory, 1690 to present. Um, this is, you can search by title, um, you can search by place, keyword, and you can find newspapers that way, and that will also list the holding repository. Okay, another place to look is WorldCat. If you're familiar with WorldCat, WorldCat is a database essentially of almost every library catalog in the United States, you know, both academic catalog, uh, academic library catalogs and public library catalogs. You can search uh, for, for newspapers in this database and it will give you, um, you can find the title and then it will also tell you the holding library or repository. So to get a copy of a, an obituary, or if you want to research the newspaper yourself, you know, find the newspaper title and then note the holding in institution. So as I mentioned, these print bi bibliographies that I mentioned should note the holding institution, um, the Library of Congress website, um, WorldCat, uh, will all, should all give you clues as where to find the newspaper you're looking for. Um, then, you know, once you know who has the newspaper, you can actually travel there and research it on site. Of course, that's not so much possible right now because of the pandemic. But uh, when things open up, you could go and research it on site. Or oftentimes you can place an interlibrary loan request for uh, microfilm copies. If microfilm copies are available, you can often request the microfilm copy. Um, it will be sent to your library and uh, you can view it on microfilm. Or if you, if you uh, have the date of death, oftentimes they can do a lookup for you and return you a copy that way. And you can also contact the repository directly and see if they will do a lookup for you. Okay, um, I did mention newspapers.com and newspapers.com is including more and more German language newspapers in their database. So that is certainly a place to look for uh, German language newspapers published in the United States. Uh, newspaperarchive.com is another newspaper uh, database and they actually have newspapers that were published in Germany as well, historic newspapers. And then Chronicling America, which is also from the Library of Congress, uh, is uh, digitizing newspapers and putting them on their website. So that is another source to check out. And then I would recommend this book, Historic German Newspapers Online by Ernest Thode. Uh, this book uh, includes lists of papers that are published in the United States and in Germany as well. So that would be a good place to find uh, German newspapers. Okay, so once you actually find the newspaper, how do you go about locating the death notice in the newspaper? So, uh, Oftentimes, you know, or sometimes, you know, uh, some kind soul or a library or other repository has, has created an index. We love indexes because they save us so much time. So 
check and see if there's an index. But if there's not an index, then start by checking um, the, uh, or finding the death date for the person that you are wanting to find the death notice for. So <clears throat> this is common in doing this kind of newspaper research. You know, if you don't, if, it, if it's not indexed, then find the death date of the person you are researching, you know, and do that in the usual way by checking, you know, death records, death registers, uh, and so on. So once you have the death date, you can start searching the newspaper. So search the newspaper beginning on the day of death and at least four days afterwards. Okay, so, you know, you found the, the issue for, you know, the day of death. So how do you find the uh, death notice inside? So the location within a newspaper, of course, depends on the time period of the publication, the publication itself, how they organize it, and so on. Um, most often they are located uh, within the classified ad section or just adjacent to uh, the classified ad section. But there are some visual cues that you can use. So let's look at some examples. So here is a uh, newspaper page from the Veslika Post from 1864. And so that's a, a lot of gray uh, matter right there. So how do, you, how do you find the death notice that might be on this page? Well, if you kind of scan the page and you look down in this corner, I'm going to blow that up, it looks like this. Let's look at another example. Here's another page. This is from Anzeiger des Westens from 1878. And we're going to look at this. Uh, this item here, blow that up. So what do you notice about this? Um, you will notice that there are uh, thick black bars that divide the um, death notices from each other. So here's a, a, another view with some more context uh, on the page. So you notice the black bar and in the rest of the classifieds, you know, the classified ads are separated only by a thin bar. So what I have found is that, you know, these death notices are set off by these thick black bars. They really call attention to themselves on the page. Uh, the other way uh, to find them is by the heading. So oftentimes it will say Anzeigen, which just means notices, or Neue Anzeigen, like in this example, which means new notices or recent notices. Sometimes they will be titled Todesanzeigen, which means death notices. Also, um, look for things like uh, the first word in the death notice may be in bold type and, and be set off by a drop cap. So if you look on, you know, look for your person's death notice and you look on the day of death and you look for, you know, four or more days afterwards and you don't find it, why? might you not find it. So I did a little research and <clears throat> uh, for instance, publishing a death notice in the Veslika Post in 1883 cost $1.65. We don't think that's much money, but a day, day's wage for a laborer in 1883 was about $1.30. So the cost of the death notice was more than a day's wage and you know, it's, it was expensive. So some people just could not afford to publish a death notice for their loved one. So once you, um, hold on just a second. So once you, you find the death notice, how do you decipher it? So um, death notices in these, in these kinds of, uh, Classified ads typically follow a common format. Um, the earlier ones may vary a little bit, uh, but as time went on, they really took on a definite kind of uh, format. So typically, it will give the name of the deceased, the, the day and time of death, the age at time of death, the burial day, time, and place, the address where the body lay in state, and lists of survivors with uh, their relationships to the deceased. Oh, and I might mention that the address where the body lay in state is commonly the family home. So remember that uh, 
funeral homes are a fairly recent innovation that in the 19th century especially people were still doing, you know, the, the deceased was kept at the home until the time of the funeral. Okay, so let's look at an example. So this is a death notice for Friedrich W. Osterholt. So let's see what, let's see what it, um, what it says. So we have the name of the deceased, Friedrich W. Osterholt, relation, a short relation, uh, mention of relationship to the survivors. So this, this gentleman was a husband, father, and father-in-law. Uh, the day and time of death, which was Monday at 4.30 p.m. Uh, age at time of death, which in this case was 63 years old. The burial time and place, which was at uh, Calvary Cemetery on Thursday at 8.30 a.m. And the place of the funeral service, which was St. Mary's Church. So right here you have a lot of clues. I mean, if you want to find other information, um, you'll certainly probably want to try to find a funeral record at St. Mary's Church. You also want to find a cemetery record at Calvary Cemetery. So the address where the body lay in state was 1400 Clark Avenue, which was the family home. And then the list of survivors and their relationships to the deceased. So we have the wife, we have children, we even have an uncle mentioned, a son-in-law, and then grandchildren there. So here right here you have a way of, of uh, connecting generations. Okay, so this is a translation, kind of a direct translation of the uh, death notice itself. So it reads, Friedrich W. Oster Osterholt, our beloved husband, father, and father-in-law died Monday at 4.30 p.m. after short illness at the age of 63 years. The funeral procession will take place on Thursday, 8.30 a.m. from the home of the bereaved, 1400 Clark Avenue, to St. Mary's Church for the funeral service and from there to Calvary Cemetery. Relatives and friends are cordially asked to attend. And then the list of the survivors. Okay, just a moment. I think we may have lost some sound. Can you just, someone uh, just type in the chat if they, to tell me if they can hear me. Okay, we still have sound, that's good. I don't know, some people in the chat are saying that they can't, that they have lost sound, so I'm not sure why that's happening, but it looks like um, that I'm, I'm still alive, so let's continue. Um, so then you, this is the text of the uh, death notice, and then following this is the list of survivors. Oh, and there is a mention, you know, kind of blooming, no flowers, which you often see today. So let's look at another example. Um, this is one is for Jakob Zygmunt. So it says, Jakob Zygmunt, our beloved husband and father, died last night at 12 o'clock after a brief illness at the age of 54 years, seven months, 11 days. Burial will take place today at 2 p.m. from the home. Um, from our home at Sterling and Leach Streets, relatives and friends are invited to attend. The bereaved wife, Margareta Zygmunt, and four children uh, signs the notice. So this one has less information. This is probably more typical of a death notice. Um, you know, it, it doesn't even uh, mention the children, but as I said, you know, these notices cost money and they probably charge by the word, and so the shorter the notice, then the cheaper it was. Okay, let's look at a couple more examples. Um, th these are from 1878. Uh, died in St. Charles, Missouri on the 9th of January, Crystal Gubel, wife of Gert Gubel. Very old to take place in St. Charles on the 10th of January, 10 p.m. So that one's very brief. And then the next one down, Died on the 9th of this month in the morning after short illness, my beloved husband, Michael Lipp, at the age of 37 years. Burial will take place on the 11th at 2 p.m. from the home of the bereaved, um, 2100 DeKalb Street. Relatives and friends are encouraged to attend. And then signed the widow, Anastina Lipp, uh, whose maiden name was Adamska or Adamski. 
So, you know, the question is, will you find information about the village of birth? Of course, any of us who are doing German genealogy, that is kind of the holy grail uh, of information, is finding the place of birth of our ancestors so we can do further research, you know, over in Germany. So the good news is that mention of the, mention of the birthplace is quite possible and often it's not unusual at all. Um, and, uh, but the bad news is that it's not guaranteed and it's, it's, not, uh, it's not uncommon, but it's not also terribly common at the same time. But of course, you know, this is a source that you should, uh, you should check out. If you haven't checked for a, a death uh, notice, that's certainly something you should check. So let's take uh, a look at some examples where the, the place of birth is mentioned. So we're going to look at this one for William G. Engelhardt. Um, so it says here that William G. Engelhardt was born in Debringhausen, Principality of Waldeck, Germany, and then the rest of his death information. So that's very specific. It gives the name of the village and even tells you the principality where that village occurs. So that should be very easy to uh, find and very easy to find further information in Germany. Let's look at another one. Uh, this one is for Maria Katharina Bullmann, whose maiden name was Beer. And sh this death notice mentions that she is from Rota an der Weil uh, in Nassau province. Uh, and then when she was born, and of course the burial information, and then her survivors and their relationship to her. So uh, another one where if you if you find a death notice like this, then you know it, it really opens up, uh, can break help break through that brick wall. Okay, let's look at another one. This one is quite unusual. It's quite lengthy for one thing. Uh, this is from 1893. So I'll just kind of run through the information that it gives. It, uh, it uh, starts out with our mother, the widow C.M.E. Zudhoff, died on the 12th of February, 1893 in Darum, Belm Parish near Osterbrück. Uh, age 93 years, six months, five days. Uh, she had three sons and five daughters. So then it mentions that her son Gerhard left Germany and came to St. Louis in 1856 and returned to visit his mother in 1862, 1876, and 1884. And then it mentions the grandchildren living in St. Louis and their names. Um, so, I mean, this has a lot of information. It not only gives you the birthplace, of, I mean, if, if this woman, if the mother died in this place, that's probably the like, likely the birthplace of the son Gerhardt. But it also mentions that the son Gerhardt came over to St. Louis in 1856. So, so there you have an immigration year as well. So that's a, a great one. Okay, so that is kind of a run through of some of the typical things you'll find in death notices. Now I'm going to talk about some other kinds of notices that are related. And a uh, principle among these is our lodge notices. So <clears throat> Germans were very you know, German immigrants were very social people and they liked to belong to uh, lodges and societies and other organizations. And so when one of their members died, they often would publish a notice in the newspaper. So here are a couple of examples of those. So the first one is uh, from an organization called the Ancient Order of United Workmen. So this was the Frank P. Blair Lodge, excuse me, Blair Lodge, uh, R356 here in St. Louis. And it translates, the officers and members of the above named lodge are requested to assemble in the lodge hall on Monday at 1 p.m. sharp in order to attend the burial of our deceased brother, Charles Schmidt, on behalf of the WA, I'm not sure what that is, some kind of office, Nils Johnson, and then Fred Vogus Recorder. So here's another one from the GAR, which of course is the Grand Army of the Republic. So in this case, the deceased actually was in, had served in the Union Army. So that's another clue um, there. 
so Charles Smith, comrade of Charles Demney Post, number 301, died on Saturday at 4 a.m. Burial will take place on Monday, the 3rd of April, 2 p.m. From 2751 Arsenal Street, all members are invited to attend and take part in the burial rites. And then it's got some uh, names of some officers there. So here are uh, these three um, notices together. They're all, well, we'll just go through this. So the first one is the actual death notice. This death notice is for Carl Schmidt, who died on the 1st of April at 4 a.m. His burial will be at 2 p.m. from the residence, 2751 Arsenal Street. So the next one down from this lodge is for a Charles Schmidt, and it says meet at 1 p.m. to on Monday to attend the funeral. And the third one is for a Charles Smith, who died at 4 a.m. Uh, burial is Monday, 2 p.m. from the residence, 2751 Arsenal. So what do you have here? You have a death notice and then two notices from organizations um, all pertaining to the same person. But you notice here that there are three different names. There's Carl Schmidt, there's Charles Schmidt, and there's Charles Smith. So this uh, just highlights one of the challenges uh, one of the challenges of doing German genealogy are these um, German names and how they're often, you know, translated into English or not translated into English, or sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. And, and here you have the example of one person who's referred to in three different ways. So uh, more about these lodge notices. Um, uh, lodge notices usually appear in addition to the general notice of death, but they might be they might be the only one. So if the family you know, didn't publish a death notice or they couldn't afford to publish a death notice, there still might be a lodge notice if that person belonged to a lodge. Um, um, they don't usually offer additional information, but they can provide uh, interesting evidence of activities and other clues. So for example, we saw in the, in the example we, we just talked about, we saw that, uh, that the deceased belonged to the Grand Army of the Republic. So we know that he served in the Union Army. Um, and then of course, because they are lodges, because they are, are organizations, they might possibly have records someplace. And so that's something that you could uh, look for and it possibly could lead to further information. Okay, another type of notice that was published were memorials. Now, in uh, I have found these referred to in the German newspapers as Nachruf, which uh, in German means obituary, but they're really memorials. Uh, these were published um, on, usually on the anniversary of death, like one year, five year, 10 years, whatever. So for instance, this one is very typical. Um, it starts out to my husband and father, Fred, Frederick Horseman, who died on the 27th of January, 1893. And then it's, that is followed by this uh, poem. Sometimes it's a poem, sometimes it's a hymn verse or something like that. And then uh, signed by the uh, widow. So this person died in January of 1893 and this uh, memorial was published in April of 1893. Also, you know, um, if, you, if you're from a small town, you're familiar with the notices of thanks which appear in local newspapers, and that was certainly uh, a practice in, in the German communities as well. So you will find these Dankzagungen, which are notices of thanks. So let's just look at uh, one of those. So this is for, uh, from 1893 and it uh, translate as, the undersigned hereby expresses her most obliging thanks to Unity Lodge number 851, K of H, which I think is Knights of Honor, uh, the North Star Lodge number 45, um, and I'm not sure what that is, United Order of something, and Valhalla Lodge number 236, uh, Daughters of Herman. Uh, for the diligent and generous payout of sick and death benefits and, and can wholeheartedly recommend the above named lodges to every head of house. I especially thank all the members and singers in the Harmony Men's Chorus for their attendance during the illness and burial of my departed husband. Signed with greatest thanks, Berta Ruff, wife and children. Uh, 
So this points something out. Um, it knows, notices here that she mentions payout of sick and death benefits. So one of the reasons that uh, uh, German immigrants uh, joined these lodges was because it was a way to provide death benefits for the family. Uh, these lodges often, um, as part of their membership benefits, provided uh, uh, money to cover um, you know, sickness or um, you know, uh, burial expenses when the person died. It was a uh, you know, predecessor to our health and life insurance, really. But one thing, you, one thing is missing here, and what is that? The name of the deceased is not mentioned. So the survivor is mentioned, the wife is mentioned. So, um, so this would be something else you might wanna look for is uh, looking under these notices of thanks or these Dongzagungen uh, for the survivor's name, not the uh, deceased name. Okay, so these were you know, all classified ads. These were uh, ads that people paid to have published in the newspaper. What, but what about um, death information before classified ads became, um, became common? So death notices as classified ads began to appear in the mid 19th century. Um, but before that, um, or up until that time, reports of death often appeared as news items. Uh, sometimes they were very brief. They were just a mention that someone in the community had died. Uh, these were most common though in case of tragedy, crime, accident, or deaths of notable persons or in some kind of unusual uh, circumstance. Um, okay, so uh, let's look at this one. This is a news item. This is from the Veslika Post in 1858. So, um, sudden death, Mr. Noel Silrota, a Swiss, and owner of Banks Exchange, a popular tavern and coffee house on the levee between Plum and Poplar Streets, repaired yesterday morning to the attic to feed his doves. He climbed on a box when he suddenly suffered a bout of apoplexy and fell to the floor. A nearby doctor was called, but he was ready, already dead when the doctor arrived. The coroner held an inquest and sworn witnesses attested to the facts. The deceased was 63 years old. So here there's actually a lot of information in this news item. I mean, it talks about this gentleman who died. You know, we know that he was Swiss, we know he owned a business, we know where that business was, and we know that there was a coroner's report. And so, uh, you know, all these things, a business, the coroner's report especially, you know, create records. So those are things you will want to uh, look for. So how do you find um, these uh, death note or death information, you know, in these news items? It's going to be more difficult than it is in the classified ads because the name is not probably going to be highlighted. It's going to be buried in the text. So you'll want to recognize, learn to recognize a person's name and look for it when you're scanning the text. So um, let's move beyond death notices to uh, look at other places where you might find death information in the newspapers. <clears throat> um, so look for an article or detailed obituary, uh, this especially in cases where a person owned a business or was particularly well known or prominent in the community. So oftentimes an article or a detailed obituary will appear a lot, uh, as well as a brief death notice. So let's look at an example here. This is from, uh, this was one of my own ancestral relatives. This was my great, great grandfather's brother. So Philip Mueller, beloved father of Charles and Fred Mueller died on fr Friday, the 21st of June, 1907 at 11 p.m. at the age of 74 years, five months and nine days. Burial will take place on Monday, the 24th of June from the home of the bereaved, 1139 Rector Streets to St. Newmark, to New St. Marcus Cemetery. Friends and relatives are encouraged to attend. And then of course the list of survivors and their relationship to the deceased. So this is a, a fairly typical um, death notice as we have seen. It was published in the Best Like a Post on the 24th of June, 1907 on a Monday. 
So I started looking around in this newspaper and lo and behold, on Sunday, the day before, I find, you know, it, in kind of the, uh, sec this was a Sunday supplement. It was kind of a, the, the social news. Um, I found this uh, lengthy, fairly lengthy obituary, which included a photograph of the guy. So um, I won't translate the whole thing, but it, it will mention, it mentions these things, a well-known he was a well-known citizen and business, businessman in South St. Louis that I knew. He was a saddle maker, had his own saddle making shop um, here in St. Louis. And then he died Friday at home at 1139 Rutgers Street. We knew that from, the, from his death notice. He was 74 years old. But here is the clincher, born in 1833 in Ober Ingelheim. So this is a case where, you know, my direct ancestor, this guy's brother, I had been searching for his birthplace in Germany for years. And it was only by researching uh, the brother um, whose obituary we're reading here that I was able to find the village of uh, birth. Um, and so from that, I was able to actually find records in Ober Ingelheim, and I've been able to trace that, that line back to the 17th century at least. Um, so this just brings up a point that you know don't just research your immediate ancestor research you know the collateral lines research their siblings research their you know the fan club friends associates neighbors because you never know where this kind of information is going to show up uh, he came to st louis in 1858 which i thought was very interesting uh, early, uh later than my great great uh, grandfather um, and then he established a saddle shop in the 1860s which he handed over to his son Charles six years before his death. Uh, the shop gives the address where the shop stood. And his son Fritz uh, operated a large saddle business in Denver, which is another interesting story, which I won't go into here. But uh, he had a son who opened up the Fred Mueller Saddle Company in Denver, Colorado, which was quite successful and well known. So, but let's look at the chronology here. Um, so Philip Mueller died on Friday, the 21st of June. The article, which we just looked at, was published on Sunday, the 23rd of June. And then the death notice, you know, which was paid for by the family, was actually published not until Monday, the 24th of June. So, um, you know, in this case, you know, that's why you need to kind of start at the day of death and work forward, um, because you never know you know, if there was an obituary, it might show up in, uh, before the actual death notice or an article. So we've, we've looked at uh, these death notices and other notices and kind of the, the format they, they take and where you find them. So let's just talk a little bit about um, the language, uh, the fractur typeface, and the alphabet. So um, the typeface um, that these newspapers were printed in and most uh, literature from from that time period was published in Germany in, in German rather uh, was called Fraktur. So Fraktur, which means fractured, uh, was named after the kind of uh, fractured or broken appearance, you know, uh, that the the letter forms had because of their angular lines. It was based on handwriting styles used in manuscripts and developed over several hundred years. It came in use in the 16th century in Germany about the time that printing became popular. Interestingly enough, it was outlawed by the Nazi regime, re regime in 1941. So after 1941, uh, things that were published in Germany were usually published in just the typical Roman typeface that we're uh, used to. It was also used in Scandinavia and Balkan countries as well. Uh, the equivalent English type style we call Old English. So a little bit about the German alphabet. Um, the alphabet is essentially the same as the English alphabet, but there are a few special uh, letters or additional letters that you will not find in English. Uh, uh, primary among these is the umlauted vowels, um, the a -O, a, O, and U with the two dots above them are the umlauted vowels. The umlaut 
stands for an E. So it stands for the letter combinations of A, E, O, E, and U, E. And sometimes you will actually see words spelled that way. And then there is a special character called an S, Z, which looks kind of like a B and can be confused with a B. Um, it only appears in lowercase. Um, if you find it in all caps headlines, it will be uh, represented by a double S and it does represent the double S sound. And then Q, X, and Y are rarely used except in names and foreign words. So um, I included in your handout a uh, Fraktur chi uh, chart. This has the uh, Fraktur letter forms with their you know, Roman type equivalents. Um, so let's look a little closer at this. Uh, in that chart, I've include, included a chart of easily confused forms. One of the challenges with the frock tour typeface is that, you know, some of the letter forms actually resemble each other closely, like, especially like the V and the V here, the J and the I. Um, over here, there's you know, C, E, G, and S, and so on. The M and W um, can often be confused. So, something to look out for. And then in Fraktur, there are three letter forms that can represent the letter S. Uh, there's the sort of straight up and down form that kind of resembles an F, but it doesn't have a complete crossbar in it. And that uh, occurs at the beginning of a word or syllable or in the middle of a syllable. So some uh, examples of words are like gast or stehen, where, where, where it starts the beginning of a word or is in the middle of a word or a syllable. So then the regular S, the curly S that we use, um, only occurs at the end of a word or syllable. So for instance, trauer house or house frau. House, house frau house is the end of a uh, the S is at the end of a syllable. Um, and then the S set, as I mentioned before, uh, equals a double S, as in the words Strasse, which means street. And then, you know, it was a, a, a convention in typesetting to use what are called ligatures, which um, are uh, letters that are kind of joined together uh, so that they look better in, in terms of spacing but they can often be confusing because then they end up looking like a different kind of letter. So I've put some of those in there so you can see examples of those and um, kind of look out for that as well. So I just wanted to give you a little test. You know, what does this say? This is a, a paragraph uh, printed in Fraktur. So what does this say? You know, if you don't know German, then you're probably you know, not going to know this. I mean, this is actually the introduction to the um, fairy tale uh, Little Red Riding Hood, which in German is Rockkäppchen. Okay, now take a look at this paragraph and tell me what it says. So probably you can read this, and of course this is the beginning of what? The Gettysburg uh, Address. Four score and seven years ago our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, etc. So what is the point of this? We read words and phrases, not individual letters. So you were able to, even though, you know, in the last example with the Gettysburg Address, you probably didn't recognize every single letter in there. You could probably still read that paragraph because you could recognize enough of it to recognize words and phrases. So we read words and phrases, not individual letters. So if you familiar yourself, familiarize yourself with German words, learn to recognize them in print, uh, it will help you when you go to try to decipher these, uh, these texts. So in your uh, handout, there should be a link to a word list that you might find helpful. Um, it will have the, uh, these are words that you're gonna commonly find in like church records or obituaries or some common records. So for instance, uh, you know, here's a, a close up of, of the page. And so you have the word in, uh, presented in Fraktur in German, then the uh, word in Latin type in 
in German, and then the English equivalent. So um, one trick is to, when you're trying to recognize a name, you know, you can, uh, for instance, if you actually find a death notice or if you find the name in print, you can actually cut that out, copy it, cut it out, and keep that with you. And then you know what the name looks like when you're, um, when you are uh, searching through text for the name. The other thing you can do is you can actually type out the name in Proctor and then uh, change the font, highlight it, change the font in using Word or another word processing, processing uh, program and uh, change it into Latin type so it's more recognizable. So whenever you come across a, a text, one thing you can do is transcribe the text in Fractur, like I did here, and then change the font to something typical like Times New Roman or whatever, and then you get something that's more readable. So in order to do this, you have to find the Fractur fonts and install them on your computer. Fortunately, they're out there and they are free. You will find them on a site called uh, thousandonefonts.com. And uh, one of the ones that I've used is called Bright Cop Fractur. Download that to your computer and you can actually print things out in Fractur. Okay, and that kind of brings us to the end. So I've had some requests in the chat to repost the um, handout, which I will do. In the meantime, um, if you have questions, please post them in the Q&A or in the chat and I will try to uh, answer them. So I'm gonna repost the handout. And then there was a question about the word list, which I thought was mentioned in the handout, but it's not. So let me let me um, let me try to find that as well. Um, hold on. And uh, so I apologize for that. So. Um, okay, so I'm going to post a link to a web page, and this will have the word list, the Fractur guide, and some other information on there for deciphering death notices. Okay, so, um, okay, so um, I did post a link to the handout. I post a link to a web page that has other information. Let's see. Let me see. All right. It looks like I did not post that to all pan everyone. So let me do that again. Um, okay. So this is the web page. And And this will be the handout. Okay, so let me go back, scroll through, back through here. Um, okay, so I did mention that I had a question about the recorded class. Yes, this is being recorded. Uh, I will. Uh, we will post it on our website and I will post a link. It will take probably at least a week for us to do that. So don't look for it tomorrow, uh, but I will post a link to the page where that will be posted. If we call it this our virtual classroom. If you go there, you will find uh, other classes that we've recorded. We've been recording all of our classes. so. This would be an opportunity for you to check out what's available there as well. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. Let's see. Or 
reserve list, okay. Okay, so that so the uh, page with the word list and the handout should be linked in the chat now. Uh, okay. Um, okay. So I have a question: wasn't unusual Wasn't it unusual for Germans to fight in any of our wars in the earlier war? So I'm not sure what the question is there. Um, the example I had was someone who, a German immigrant who had been a member of the, the Grand Army of the Republic, which means that he's fought in the German army. So that was very common. There were many German immigrants who did uh, join the Union cause. German immigrants by and large were anti-slavery and um, so that was very common. Um, and many times they, they, they served and were never naturalized. So they, they, they served even though they did not, were not full citizens of the United States. Okay. Um, okay, any other questions? Okay, um, I do have our contact information up there. Um, you know, do feel free to contact us anytime. Um, you don't have to be a library patron or live in our area to contact us. We're happy to help you wherever you live. So uh, give us a call or send us an email. We'd be glad to um, help you out. So, Scott, yes. Did you answer the questions in the Q&A? Okay, hold on. Let me there open up the There are three in there that I think that I didn't hear an answer to. Okay. Thank you for pointing that out. So. Questions were, was the $1.85 rate for death notices representative of the cost for other classified ads on the page? Were they more expensive or cheaper? You know, I don't know. I, uh, I think they were for, I think that was the rate for all classified ads. Um, but, you know, I, it's been a while ago that I'm not, I'm not totally sure. Um, the lodge notices typically only for men, or are there notice for notices for females as well? Um, I, as my recollection is, is that there were lodge notices for females as well, because many of these lodges had a a, a corresponding women's organization, and so you would find them for women, men, men female members as well. Okay, how do we get the handouts? Okay, so that should be in the chat. List of German new newspapers towards the beginning. The first two were local to St. Louis and the third was national, yes. So um, there was a newspaper called Ostfriesische um, Nachrichten. So that was a national newspaper, but as I mentioned, this was, this was uh, published for immigrants from Ostfriesland. So Ostfriesland is a area of Eastern Lower Saxony. Um, it's its own, has its own language and culture. Uh, the newspaper is published in high German, but uh, the native language there is actually Friesisch. Um, it's uh, not even German, it's a separate language, separate Germanic language. Um, people there also spoke Low German. It's a language that's almost extinct at this point. But uh, as, in, it, as is, was the case all over Germany and, and among all German immigrants, uh, high German or standard German dialect was used uh, for communications, for print, um, in church services, um, newspapers, that kind of thing. So, um, and then I've had some, you know, other comments, you know, uh, thanking me for the session and I appreciate that. I'm glad that uh, uh, for those of you who, who, who post those comments, you know, I, I appreciate, I'm glad that this was helpful. I hope you found it helpful and, uh, and uh, that you can take something away from this and, and that you, you know, try this out yourself. Try to find a German newspaper, see if you can find a death notice for a, an ancestor and, and give it a try and see how, how you do. Um, Someone's asking for you to uh, say the name of your YouTube channel again. Okay, so the 
our videos will be posted on our library website. Uh, they will also be posted on the YouTube channel for the library, and the library is St. Louis County Library. So it will be posted both places. They are YouTube videos, but they will also be linked on our webpage, and I put that link in the chat. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, I, don't know <laughs> I think that um, if we, if there are no more questions, I think we'll end this here. Um, so I just want to thank you for joining us today. I hope that you enjoyed the class and found the information to be useful. Um, I would also like to thank the Tri-State Genealogical Society in Evansville, Indiana for inviting us to do this program. Um, if you have any further questions or comments about the lecture, please feel free to contact us at, at the History and Genealogy Department. And I do have the contact information up there on the screen. If you are watching this live, I remind you that this class has been recorded and will be made available on the library's website at www.slcl.org slash genealogy and the library's YouTube channel. If you are watching this on YouTube, we invite you to like this video and post a comment uh, below. So um, I'm going to check to see if there are any more questions before we end. And it uh, doesn't look like it. So I think we're going to end the Zoom session here. So thank you very much again for attending and uh, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. <laughs>